Greetings, Divinity School community. I'm so delighted to see you all in person and welcome you to the 2022-2023 academic year. For as long as I've been here, all four and a half years, this community has gathered to formally mark the opening of the academic year. Of all the rituals and ceremonies steeped in higher education, I hold a particular fondness to the annual Aims of Education gathering. The significance of us coming back together to begin again as a community is rejuvenating to me. At last year's convocation, Professor Karen Kraza reminded us about the power of curiosity. She went on to quote Walter Morris who said, curiosity is the most powerful incentive in the world because it is capable of overcoming the two most powerful disincentives in the world, common sense and fear. This place is full of curiosity. As we start anew today, our collective work in asking questions, considering perspectives, and forming new thought, it is that curiosity, that pursuit, that holds us together in community. And the exciting thing is that we have new folks to have that conversation with. New scholars, new leaders, new students who will enrich us and be enriched by us. At this time, I invite all of our new colleagues to stand and be recognized. Yes, that's you, new students. <laughs> Welcome. We look forward to all you will add to the rich legacy of the Divinity School. In that same address last year, Professor Krause also reminded us about the responsibility of giving thanks. In that spirit, I wanna pause and publicly thank everyone that has contributed to welcoming and orienting our new colleagues, to our faculty presenters and campus partners, to everyone that reminded me to press record in the Zoom, <laughs> to our new students who came ready, engaged, and energetic, to our DSA leadership, to the Dean of Students staff, thank you. I especially want to thank um, the person behind this, this week's events in food logistics, Rama Halilovic. <laughs> Rayma has been here bright and early each morning to welcome caterers. She's hustled across the building to make rooms, make sure rooms were set up just right. Rayma, thank you for your tireless efforts um, and your contribution to new student orientation. The order of today's ceremony is as follows. We will have a reflection by Isaac Santana, PhD student in theology and president of the Divinity Students Association. A reading by Suzanne Riggle, associate dean for finance and administration. Opening remarks and introduction of our keynote speaker, Professor Anand Venkat Krishnan by interim dean James Robinson. And a closing professor, uh, reflection by Cynthia Lindner. Welcome and welcome back. I'm truly glad to see you and I look forward to all this year brings. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday, happy fall, happy new academic year, and very happy to have you and to be here today. My name is Isaac Santana. I'm a PhD student in theology here at the Divinity School. In this moment, though, I speak to you as president of the Divinity Students Association, our building's long storied institutional effort to do everything we can to make the student experience here at the Divinity School something you'll never forget in the good kind of way. <laughs> I'm here to deliver some words as a student leader directly to our students here at the start of another lovely academic year. 
This year will most certainly bring the same joyous smiles and ambivalent side glances, precious gleanings, priceless challenges, newfound ignorances, and of course, the victories and struggles of every year that is now past. I do, however, have a pretty good feeling about this one. I think this, this is finally the year we solve all of these pesky problems we've been dealing with for millennia, and finally put this inquiry thing behind us once and for all. So next year, we can all enjoy early retirements uh, and have this ceremony in the south of France or Hawaii. Uh, please book your tickets well in advance and forge your bill to the Franz Bibfeldt Trust. Before I give my words, however, I do want to begin as a student by offering the most heartfelt, genuine, grateful, and warmest of thank yous to the people in this building. I have, many of you know, worked in several capacities in my time here. First as a student myself, of course, but also as an area assistant, a bonds mentor, uh, area assistant and bonds mentor in the Dean of Students office, as the DSA president and as a teaching assistant. These many roles have given me ample opportunity to work very closely with each arm of SWIFT, whether that be the Dean of Students, the Dean, the Martin Marty Center, or the faculty and staff altogether. On the whole, I believe our students feel genuinely cared for, valued, and challenged in all the good ways. Whether that be mercy and understanding in some moments or tough love and difficult conversations in others, I know full well that the people around here give a damn, to borrow a phrase from my childhood. Specifically, over the last three years, I've seen countless examples of people in this building looking out for each other. Much of it, because of the nature of these bad times, are closed door goodnesses, things that the light of day will never shine upon. But if I can also borrow a tired and surely antiquated mythical form of expression here, God sees all. So these goodnesses are anything but forgotten. Could things be better? Of course. But my life, my upbringing, my continued days tends to weigh things from another point of view as well. Could things be worse? Truly, here at Swift, there is a far longer drop to the bottom than there is distance to the summit. And that, I think, must be counted as blessing. Things in these last few years have made this, this study and this inquiry almost impossibly hard for many of us. But I've seen time and again when you were doing all you could to keep us moving forward into better and brighter days. For that, I am, we are, unspeakably grateful. From the rock bottom of our hearts, thank you. And please, keep giving a damn. For a moment, please go back with me to March of 2021. We are in a dingy basement apartment in Hyde Park. The camera visible area uh, clean and presentable, but, but the rest of the apartment uh, is stacked with dirty dishes and dirty clothes, unmade beds, empty bottles, stale air, and a door whose hinges haven't given evidence of being able to operate in six days. It's 3 p.m., so your three-hour Zoom course is wrapping up now. It was nice, I guess. You didn't do the reading as closely as you would have liked, but then again, some people clearly didn't do it at all. The professor struggled to exercise their full pedagogical and intellectual strength on this platform, but you're still grateful for their efforts. Some parts of the conversation were actually genuinely good. Others so bad they made you question the point of even doing this under such circumstances. Finally, the professor dismisses the class and everyone waves at the camera smiling. Bye, see you next time, enjoy the weekend, thank you. Meeting has been ended by host. You see in high contrast over a much hazier vision of your reflection on the now black screen. For the briefest of moments, you awkwardly catch yourself waving and smiling at an inanimate machine and the wall behind it. Or, in another way of understanding, waving and smiling to nothing at all. You haven't seen the flesh of another human face in a week and not a beloved or even just familiar face in almost six you realize once again, painfully, that this liquid crystal display is the poorest of substitutes for being with others, arising in you a loneliness that even pure solitude may never have reached on its own. Yet you partially can't wait for your next Zoom class, a brief respite against this cold loneliness that even in its stark deficiency is doing something to keep you afloat, to keep you sane, to keep you moving forward. 
It may surprise many of you to hear that before the pandemic, and even now to some extent, I am naturally an introvert. I need to be alone to rest, to relax, to make peace with my life in the world. However, when I was forced to never be with anyone else, to spend weeks at a time with only minutes of real human interaction, I realized just how vital that being with others actually is. Swift carries many reputations, amongst them being the best place in the world to study religion. This building, over the years, has seen the birth of some of history's most daring, critical, and creative thoughts. And much of that is owed to our ethos of limitless inquiry, that nothing is so sacred as to not be questioned. However, this ethos and the people it attracts naturally leads to another one of Swift's reputations, of sometimes being a colder place to be than the winter winds outside of its walls. This is an inevitable trade-off to some extent, it is true. Unlike many other places which are able to gather around the well-fueled fires of common understandings and commitments, visions and goals, cultures or experiences, the members of our community rally under no single banner, pledge allegiance to no single ideology, serve no one king or cause, refuse to accept any singularity as a ruling principle of us all. We are a motley crew, that is sure. In fact, the very word community itself may not be the most appropriate way for art to under, uh, understand ourselves. To employ the universally respected and highly developed science of anecdotal etymological analysis, <laughs> it is speculated that community comes to us via a long journey from Latin where calm meant something around the lines of in common, public, shared by all, or many, general, not specific, or familiar. And the munia meant public duties, functions, office. Such common duty or non-specific function is certainly not a trait that one could attribute to our divinity school. We place a much higher esteem in individualism and independence, not the much maligned rogue or callous form, as much as the kind of individualism that is actually a higher level of responsibility. And we're not sorry for it. There is indeed, we say with a sanguine smile, no ruler, creed, cause, or dream that we submit to. This is a realm of free thinkers and actors, and unabashedly so. But does this then exclude us from the benefits of community? Is this, in the end, a Faustian bargain, where purchase of genuinely free thought and exploration comes at the steep cost of an insatiable thirst for belonging, for the feeling of togetherness? No. I do not believe so. In these ever-brightening days, far from the stinging isolation of dingy apartments, I find myself together again with my friends here at Swift Hall. My questions are not the same as theirs, though I still hold out hope that uh, everyone will eventually come around to my answers. <laughs> Nor are my, uh, are my overall concerns, commitments, or aspirations for the world. We are not comforted in the same ways on cold nights, nor do we agree on what we see in witnessing the fiery sun rise up from the east. But what I can do, what I can appreciate, respect, even love in my friend, is that they do. That they question, that the days of their lives, the pain and pleasure, the burning of eternity on their hearts is real. That I can embrace and promise to be there for them in it. I can give my support, I can cherish them, I can offer myself as someone to lean on, fully knowing that I don't really know what it is I'm helping with by way of idea, cause, or creed. What I do know is that I am helping them, a human being doing their best to navigate this vast ocean of existence just like me. We may never find any banner that all at Swift will rally under, this is true, but this does not exclude us from togetherness from the precious being there-ness that enlivens and makes invaluable so many aspects of our lives. So, students and all others of Swift, I encourage you, beg of you, to cultivate the kind of warm-hearted humanity, support, presence, and love for your peers that is so direly needed for any person that chooses to embrace this world, this experience of life, with clear eyes and a full heart. Be a friend, be an ear, be a backbone, be there, even when, or perhaps especially when, there is no other reason to do so 
other than the human being in front of you who simply needs it. I promise the favor will be returned in kind. At our end, we all die alone. We have been oft reminded. But as it turns out, just as inevitably, life necessitates a kind of togetherness. For those things you must face alone, Godspeed. I believe in your victory. For those things that require more than one pair of hands, I wish you all of the compassion, generosity, and invaluable presence of friendship, that blessing of the other you could possibly need. And I pray the same from you for the blessing of that other. Welcome back to Swift. I wish you all the best in asking your questions of existence as existence surely continues to ask its questions of us. Thank you. Anyways, anyone born anywhere near my hometown says it this way, with an S on the end. The lake is cold, but I swim in it anyways. Kilbasa gives me heartburn, but I eat it anyways. She, he treats me bad, but I love her, him, anyways. Even after we have left that place and long settled elsewhere, this is how we say it, plural. I never once, not once, thought twice about it until my husband, a man from far away, leaned toward me one day during our courtship. His gray-green eyes, which always sparkle, doubly sparkling over our candlelit meal. Anyway he said. And when he saw that I didn't understand, he repeated the word, anyway. Way, not ways. Corner of napkin to corner of lip, he waited. I kept him waiting. I knew he was right, but I kept him waiting anyways in league still with me and mine, Slovaks homesick for the old country their whole lives, who dug gardens anyways and deep hard water wells. I looked into his eyes, their smoky constellations, and then I told him, it is anyways, plural, because the word must be large enough to hold all of our reasons. Anyways is our way of saying there is more than one reason, that there is that which is beyond reason, that which cannot be said. A man dies and his widow keeps his shirts. They are big, but she wears them anyways. The shoemaker loses his life savings in the Great Depression, but gets out of bed every day anyways. We are shy, my people, not given to storytelling. We end our stories too soon, trailing off anyways. The carpenter sighs. I didn't need that finger anyways. The beauty school student sighs. It'll grow out anyways. <laughs> Our faith is weak, but we go to church anyways. The priest at St. Cyril's said God loves us. We hear what is not said. <laughs> this is what he must know about me, this man, my love. My people live in the third rainiest city in the country, but we pack our big picnic baskets as the sky darkens. We fall in love knowing it may not last, but we fall. This is how we know home. Someone who will look into our eyes and say what could ruin everything, but say it regardless.
Welcome. Uh, Dean Lumpkin and Anita began this session with gratitude, with an expression of gratitude. I think the gratitude is growing from my perspective, seeing the wonderful presentations that are, are beginning this welcome ceremony. Uh, anyways, in every other way whatsoever. <laughs> So I want to begin with some thanks, and then I'll move to the welcome, and the most important welcome of all to Anand, uh, who will give our Aims of Education speech, and to his parents sitting in the back. Uh, welcome Anand's parents. <laughs> so thank you, first of all, to Anita, to Dean Lumpkin, uh, for your presentation, for framing this, but for pulling the orientation together this year and every year, for sustaining the students, for providing them with the support they need, the services, uh, the culture that allows them to flourish, flourish here. Thank you, Anita, and thanks to the Dean of the Students Office in general. <laughs> Thank you to Isaac. Uh, I, I think we, we can follow formal titles. Thank you to President Santana. Uh, <laughs> Dean Lumpkin, President Santana. Santana. Uh, get the American A in there. Um, there's an old rabbinic saying that says that any community thrives only with, with, uh, through their children. Uh, any academic community thrives only through their students. And, and really, as expressed so clearly by Isaac today, um, the students here are the heart of the institution. So thank you, Isaac, and thank you for your service as president. Now into your second year. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Dean Riggle, uh, we, we do stick to formal titles, um, uh, for the wonderful reading of the poem. Uh, and thank you also for everything you do. You will soon realize, all of you new people, and you will remember uh, frequently, all you returning people, that the institution is held together by uh, Dean Riggle. Uh, the students are, are the heart of the institution. The finances are not insignificant either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, uh, Suzanne, and thank you really to all of you, uh, staff, especially faculty, everyone for attending the event today. And welcome, welcome to the new students here. Uh, the many who stood up at the beginning of the session, to the returning students, and I've seen many, uh, to the teaching fellows, new and old, to faculty and teaching faculty in general, uh, new and old, uh, uh, two new ones I see uh, uh, immediately as I look out into the audience. Welcome to, most simply, the new year. Um, there is a circular nature to ritual, as, as I need to express. This is her fourth year, fifth year. This is my second year. Um, being involved in the ceremony. There is a circular nature to ritual, which I think is very important. It sets time up in a very, um, in a very consistent way. But I think that those who are returning today, perhaps especially Isaac and those who participated in the ceremony last year, um, there is also a spiral uh, effect to it. Uh, we're spiraling up for every year you come back and you start at a new place. Uh, the next year it will be something different as well. So always remember where you were and where you're moving toward. As uh, some of you know, the new students from the welcome event on Monday, uh, I'm, uh, I'm fond of metaphors for learning and education. Monday's metaphor was flowers and weeds, uh, borrowed from a 10th century philosopher, Al-Farabi, in Baghdad. What I'd just like to introduce you briefly is, briefly is another metaphor drawn from a 20th century philosopher, Isaiah Berlin from his book, The Hedgehog and the Fox. A short book that you should all read. It will take you just an hour. Uh, read it quickly and read it closely and read it again and again. Uh, the title is drawn from one of Aesop's fables and describes two types of scholars, the hedgehog and the fox. The hedgehog burrows deep, uh, collects all it can, burrows deep, uh, um, saves it in his, in his small hole in the earth, reads everything on a single subject and grows from there, expands. But everything related to the single subject, no looking sideways, look down, uh, uh, look at the same uh, problems over and over again. And what you have is a very deep, uh, to use the metaphor in, in every respect, a very deep understanding of every subject. The fox, on the other hand, roves, ranges uh, widely, considers every subject, is curious about everything, sniffs and smells for any of those who have lived with animals, you know. There's nothing like experience life, experiencing life through smell, uh, wandering throughout the countryside, investigating everything. Two different types of scholar. The one who burrows in becomes an expert, has a singular focus on one subject, something that I certainly was as a graduate student. I always embraced, when I first read the book, the ideal of the hedgehog. 
the fox is something different, although not entirely different. Perhaps this, this is a range of possibilities. The fox is something I've become, at least I like to think I've become over the years, as I learn more and more, experience more and more, and extend my own experience. What I adjure you, exhort you to do as you begin your first year and continue your studies going forward, think about who you are and where you start. Build on strengths and appreciate what you bring to any subject on your own, but also try to be someone else as well. Or to say it in a slightly different way, don't be afraid to be both hedgehog and fox. Uh, both contribute to any complete study and any complete experience of, of the life you will have at Swift Hall. And now the most fun is to introduce Anand, uh, my most holy responsibility during this uh, welcome ceremony. It is a great honor to introduce our colleague uh, Anand Venkat Krishnan, uh, assistant professor in the history of religions uh, with a focus on South Asian religions. Anand comes to us with uh, quite a nice uh, history of education. He was a BA at Stanford. He did his Columbia, uh, PhD at Columbia, postdoc at Oxford, preceptor in Sanskrit at Harvard. You see, he's been around. You've been to some good places. But of course, the only place that matters is Chicago, where uh, <laughs> uh, Anand is entering his fourth uh, year. Anand is uh, the author of a book almost out. It is on its way off called Love in the Time of Scholarship. And he is going to present us a lecture today with an equally elusive title for those with a fondness for pop culture. Uh, with an equally elusive title, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Have Fun. Please join me in welcoming Anna. Don't tell anyone, but I used to be a serious person. I thought that every decision, every action, had a moral and metaphysical significance. My failure was a symptom of everyone's failure. It was a level of severity familiar from many religious traditions. It endowed each act with an intensity of purpose, including the command to study. For example, when quarantined in a Wyoming concentration camp in 1943, the Japanese Buddhist priest Nyogen Senzaki wrote in his journal, war or no war, the study of Buddhism must be continued. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught his followers that to study knowledge in God's name is to dread him, to seek it out is to worship him. To commit it to memory is to glorify him, to discuss it is to wage holy war, to instruct novices in it is to give alms, to dispense it freely to the qualified is to do righteous deeds. In the Sanskrit Katha Saritsagara, the humiliated king yells at his ministers, give me scholarship or give me death. This is now the motto on you Chicago Sanskrit t-shirts. <laughs> You'd think that loosening those ties would mean that everything was permitted. The problem is that the scholarly life to which I had defected was no less serious. Rigor, discipline, mastery, judgment, criticism. These were the virtues that conferred prestige. The only currency available to us in the absence of well, actual currency. <laughs> Education as a profession has always been about status, longed for, withheld, and envied. Yet to treat it as a vocation, a noble sacrifice unsullied by personal gain, was only possible for those who never had to worry about money in the first place. So the battle to outdo one another for moral and material supremacy went on. The seriousness of the endeavor never under question. How did I come then to a Jerry Garcia-like insistence that if it isn't fun, then what are we even doing, man? <laughs> How at the University of Chicago, of all places, can one preach the gospel of fun? In the sacred words of John McEnroe, you cannot be serious. <laughs> I learned it where I learned everything from my teachers. I'd like to tell you about some of them today. Mostly, they were on the margins of academic life. They didn't have the stature of colleagues or the security of tenure. They loved the life of learning, but the university never loved them back. That probably gave them a clearer sense of what they ought to be up to. The poet Bhartrahari says, Shrotram shrutenaiva na kundalena. 
earrings don't adorn the ears, learning does. Dhanena panir natu kankanena. Bracelets don't decorate the hands, giving does. Vibhatikaya karuna paranam paropakarair natu chandanena. It isn't lotion that makes your body glow, it's compassion and helping others. This is part one, Spectres of Saraswati. I began studying Sanskrit at the age of five. There was a private tutor in the Bay Area named Dr. Saraswati Mohan. She was a four foot 11, sprightly woman with a persistent wheeze, a penchant for oddball Ayurvedic remedies and an infinite patience for young people. She developed her own pedagogical material self-printed manuals of grammar lessons, homework exercises, and declension tables that I decorated with cartoon stickers. With Saraswati Auntie, I never felt that I couldn't do this difficult thing. She allowed me to laugh at silly sounding nouns, to play vocabulary games, to never take an exam in my life. The point of studying Sanskrit, in her view, was not to master it, to own it, to deploy it, or to defend it. The point was to enjoy it. Learning was important, but so was having fun. She left for India when I started high school. Can't say that I understood everything she taught me, but I must have picked it up by osmosis. She was just a kindly old woman to me. I'd had a vague notion that she had studied for a PhD in India and had, it, had been at Wesleyan at some point, but I assumed she was an adjunct for a short time. As I discovered in the Wesleyan archives only a few months ago, the truth is much deeper. She had studied with the leading lights of Sanskrit poetics in the 1960s and worked as a bibliographer for Indian manuscript catalogs. From 1966 to 1973, she taught Sanskrit in Wesleyan's ethnomusicology department, where she published her doctoral thesis and contributed to major Indology journals. She developed a second project on Sanskrit musicological traditions and, con and conducted manuscript research in American, European, and Indian libraries. After landing in the crossfires of budgetary restrictions and departmental priorities, she was not advanced for tenure, despite a stellar research and teaching record. It's a complicated story that I have yet to unravel. One letter in her file rated her ahead of any contemporary graduate of American universities and posited that, quote, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to find her equal in both training and accomplishment. The irony, of course, is that if she had received tenure, then maybe she would not have taught private lessons, and I wouldn't know Sanskrit. At least I wouldn't have learned it the way I did. I used to consider my Sanskrit education haphazard, undisciplined. Now I know that it was loving. Dr. Mohan transformed the bitterness of underemployment into the gift of education. This quarter, I'm reading the last text she ever read with me with my advanced Sanskrit class. It's an excerpt from Barna's Kadambari, a prose romance from the seventh century. A minister warns a prince about the dangers of youth, power, and wealth. Lakshmi, goddess of wealth, doesn't stick around in one place, he says, as if there were thorns stuck to her feet as she skips across her lotus pond. Were these lines for me? or for Saraswati Aunty. As the old proverb goes, Saraswati, goddess of learning, doesn't stay where Lakshmi holds sway. Mother-in-law and daughter-in-law seldom get along. Dr. Mohan died a few years ago. The last time I spoke to her on the phone, or tried to, she had had complications from a surgery, and fluid had leaked into her brain. She was unintelligible. It was very, very difficult. Something similar happened to another teacher of mine, John Felstener. I took his class on literary translation at Stanford. I remember him once unable to get through reading aloud a poem by Paul Celan. John died after complications from aphasia. The phenomenon of people who spent their lives with language unable to use it near the end is unspeakably sad to me. I don't mean to bring down the mood. I'm just saying that what we do with language when we still have it matters a lot. You never know whom your words will affect on any given day. Choose good ones. Saraswati will help you. Part two. Everybody having fun? <laughs> I fell in love on my first day of college, on the sofa in the graduate lounge of the classics department. Bert Lane taught Latin as an adjunct faculty member. 
He was in his 50s, thin gray hair speckled across a balding head, holding court before a gaggle of prospective freshmen. He wore what I learned to be his uniform, a flannel shirt tucked into blue jeans, round wire rim glasses on his face. He spoke with a Savannah drawl, sprinkled with Catholic school cadence. A mischievous smile constantly danced around his lips. The only thing I ever saw him eat for lunch was two Reese's peanut butter cups and a bottle of Coke. <laughs> he could never quite believe anything he said. For example, he was convinced that Jeopardy discriminated on the basis of class because they asked him on the questionnaire if he liked bowling. He was a prophet, a madman, an imp. He shivered with fury when radio shock jock Don Imus used a racist slur against the Rutgers women's basketball team. He was the only person I saw who spoke with sanitation staff like they were his neighbors, because they were. He told my parents at graduation that my work would save lives. I didn't learn much Latin from Bert. He did things very slowly and inter interrupted himself with long asides about whatever was on his mind. He concluded these digressions with the rhetorical question, everybody having fun? I still ask people this at the end of my classes, and I expect them to lie. <laughs> but I didn't take Latin because I wanted to learn Latin. I wanted to know what it was like to be a person who learned Latin. Would I be virtuous or vain, cosmopolitan or conservative, awkward or more awkward? <laughs> How could I reconcile my love of old things with my hatred of old ways? Bert taught me that none of this really mattered. What mattered was whether or not you were having fun while you still could. I transcribed his speech at the classics graduation, and I want to share some of it here. So the next few paragraphs are quotes from his speech. One of the things that the graduates today have most appreciated in those who have taught them, whether here or elsewhere, are the qualities of energy and enthusiasm. If the people teaching you don't have energy and enthusiasm, then why should you want to learn from them? or to share any interest in what they do. It just won't be convincing if they can't get excited about it themselves. Nobody would ever say that I'm not excited about this stuff. Also, energy and enthusiasm inspire people to do what they, think, what they didn't think they were capable of. With energy and enthusiasm, you can honor people because they will think, quite rightly, in my case, for example, that I'm enthusiastic about them and what they can do. That unfailingly gets the best possible response. There's nothing that will energize somebody like the notion that somebody they admire believes in them. Nothing is more powerful than that. Not in my case, not in any case. Support of people not like yourself is the very essence of magnanimity. One of the best thoughts I've ever had, if I do say so myself. <laughs> I've had a number of odd experiences. I met Betty Friedan and Liberace on the same day. And I chatted with both of them. Even though I could tell Liberace had only a few days to live, which he did, he was determined to be himself, however. He was out on a day as hot as this in his fur coat because he knew people would see him and, like me, recognize him. And he wanted us to remember him that way. He had the courage to be himself at a time when many people did not, if you know what I mean. Part three, Dharma activist. In the dark days of seriousness, I nearly became a public intellectual. <laughs> the social responsibility of the overeducated was to contribute enlightened opinions, as if telling different stories would result in different social arrangements. This was before we learned that social media was not a social good. I signed up for a class on Martin Luther King Jr. and Abraham Joshua Heschel, two religious intellectuals who attempted to build the beloved community. It was co-taught by Akiba Lerner, Richard Rorty's last student, and Mark Donnerman, a shaggy-haired Buddhist Christian trained in old-school comparative religion. Rorty, by the way, recognized when someone was having fun, which is why he criticized people who took Derrida too seriously. <laughs> when he finally finished his dissertation after 15 years, Mark produced a monumental thesis on Gary Snyder and the making of American Zen. He had spent many years doing peace work in Japan. Mark and I bonded over being preacher's kids. His background, Midwest Lutheran, and mine, Brahmin Hindu. We had both rejected one priestly caste for another. Walking and listening was important to Mark. Whenever I went out with Mark, I made new acquaintances in the neighborhood, people who were housed and unhoused alike. 
It wasn't just that he could talk with anyone, it's that he wanted to. He taught me to understand the space I was in through its history, through the lives of those who had lived there. Sho Konishi, author of a book of anarchist thought in modern Japan, says that space can be designated, fixed, and even controlled and managed by power. But what you think and do in these spaces at an undesignated time essentially determines the meaning of the space. The university was a corporate engine, yes, but it provided the conditions of other kinds of relationships. Mark's work was ultimately about relationships. He was an organizer at heart. A symposium he convened on Gary Snyder's Mountains and Rivers Without End took participants from the seminar room to a ritual circumambulation of Mount Tam. A speaker series he ran, the Aurora Forum, hosted public conversations with everyone from Cornell West to the Dalai Lama. Mark never settled down in normative academia. He directed a program at the ill-fated Institute for Transpersonal Psychology, founded a short-lived publishing company for Chinese writers entering the English language marketplace, and cobbled together teaching at community colleges. Through all the uncertainty and disappointment, there's always a glimmer of a smile on Mark's face and a knowing glint in his eyes when he unclips his John Lennon sunglasses. Whenever I visit the Bay, I try to see Mark and his wife, Mary Mitsuyoshi, a third-generation Japanese-American, fellow Warriors fan, and one-time Sanskrit student of Dr. Mohan. We met in Berkeley a few months ago. They'd come up from San Jose for the hatching of the peregrine falcons that nest on top of the university bell tower and for the Japanese-American evacuation exhibit at Bancroft Library. We sat on the steps of Sproul Hall and talked about the dispiriting future of humanistic study. Conversation turned to my interest in scholarly biographies and how my view of intellectual virtues compared to that of my institution or my field. Life returned to Mark's voice. Yes, very good, he murmured. For a moment, it didn't matter that none of his students wanted to read or to think or to hope. It was enough that someone did. I noticed a lightness in his step as we departed. One does not stand still looking for a path, as he loved to quote Reverend Mas Kodani. One walks, and as one walks, a path comes into being. Part four. Kabir says, listen up, wise guys. What can I say about my buaji, my favorite aunt, Linda Hess? She has the youngest heart of anyone I know. It's got to be the result of all the years she spent with the poet Kabir and at the Zen Center. I adore her combination of irreverence and loving care. Deny tenure at Berkeley for being a mere translator of Kabir's poems, she commuted across the bay to be a lecturer in religious studies at Stanford. For decades, she was the only specialist in Hinduism. Ironic because her favorite poet would have hated that label, yet apropos because both he and she lived on the margins. Linda bristled at anything that was too classical. We bickered about the Sanskrit epics. She felt that they were retrograde, and I said that they contained the seeds of their own questioning. She refused to condone top-down theories of anything, a democratic, but above all, a sympathetic spirit. Kabir says, I go on shouting, and the pundits go on thinking. Linda introduced me to many poets, singers, and scholars. She also introduced me to cranberry walnut bread at Berkeley Bowl, and beet chips baked in the oven, and rose hedges at the UC Botanical Garden. I'll never forget the time she made me externalize a small family conflict I was struggling with, playing the role of anxiety, capital A. She danced around me like a ghoulish apparition while I tried to push her away with my arms. Her dog, Joshi, got really excited. We giggled with relief and took him for a walk to the park. Dogs help you meet people, Linda explained. There's a whole community I've discovered. That line about discovering community is a microcosm of her career. Linda went from the serious business of comparative literature to wild adventures on the ghats of Banaras to singing bhajans with folk musicians in rural India, all without the stability that the profession promises. Kabir says, Ye sansar kagas ki puriya bund pade ghul jana. This life is a sheaf of papers, a drop of water, and it all dissolves. Someone asked Linda if she didn't find Kabir's emphasis on transience and death to be depressing. His approach, his approach to death is joyous, she said. The joy of it is that you're expressing your complete freedom from fear. Your freedom. I haven't achieved that, no way, but I hear it. Part five, this is the last part. 
here at the end of all things. The things I've learned from my teachers have less to do with the content of their expertise and more with the example of their being. In fancy terms, we call this habitus, the attitudes, dispositions, and comportments that structure scholarly practice. My own scholarly habitus, for instance, is jokey and unserious and filled with puns. The MA students, how many MA students are here? Raise your hand. Jesus. <laughs> the MA students here will take my class in the winter titled Theory and Method Man, a joke that's probably too old for most of you and too niche for the rest. <laughs> Just the way I like it. I don't think my way of being is necessarily the right one, it's just more fun. You gotta have fun before it's too late. For many people in my field, the form of scholarly prose should be utterly serious, unequivocal, scriptural. But I find it difficult to take seriously, even and especially as a virtue. What if the practice of reading a text were to take it as a joke? After all, one possible definition of a joke, a form of transmitting knowledge that requires the reader to accept the premise, could apply just as easily to scripture. Perhaps our relationship to any canon, religious or academic, would be healthier if we did not take it seriously. Seriousness is good if you want to explain why things are the way they are or were. But that is scientism. As a, human, a humanist, like an artist, offers possibilities to talk about things as they might have been, but are not unreal for not being and may still yet be. Humor is amoral and as such unreliable, but it could be gentle, soft, silly, and forgiving. In thinking about the everyday life of scholarship, for the feelings that inspire reasoning, what I really care about is a vision of scholarly life that moves from mastery, control, and rectitude to vulnerability, sensitivity, and compassion. When it comes to studying religion, sometimes good humor is better than good faith. For instance, religious studies as a social science has developed all kinds of ways of thinking about ritual theory. But when students ask me about this or that practice, I refer them to my dad's theory of the cat in the basket. He used to fulfill priestly functions for the local Hindu community on a small scale but public level. Usually he provided symbolic interpretations of ritual steps that would satisfy the audience. But on occasion, with mischief in his heart, he would refer to the cat in the basket. Before a household ceremony, the story goes, family members are running around to find a cat to place under a basket. We can't start without the cat, urged the patriarch, while the priest waited, bemused. What did the cat have to do with anything, he ventured. You see, said the patriarch knowingly, this is an ancestral practice. For generations, we have not embarked on any initiative without the cat under the basket. The priest realized that one of his own ancestors was probably responsible. Once upon a time, a cat had snuck into the ceremonial space, and the priest back then had thrown a basket over it to prevent interference. Eventually, it was incorporated into the ritual. <laughs> and that's how traditions are formed, my dad would conclude, <laughs> satisfied and full of mirth. The point of the story is not that all traditions are absurd, or that ritual efficacy is purely performative. The point was that meaning is social and historical. We do not need to appeal to antiquity or to eternal insights to justify our acts. The fact of us being here together in worship is enough. It may not be enough forever, and another generation will shuffle things up. We have found our cat, and they will find theirs. Scholarly habits form in similar ways. Spend enough time being broken down by your teachers, and you will think that criticism is a form of love. But bring your whole being into, somebody literally told me that. <laughs> But bring your whole being into the life of learning and your values change. We often talk about the life of the mind as if it were the mind that mattered, when it's really the life. It's a comically short life. Sometimes the mind disintegrates before the body. It reminds me of a Sanskrit proverb about getting lost in the weeds of learning. Anantaparam kila shabda shastram. The science of language stretches on without end. Swalpam tathayur bhavascha vigna. Life is short, obstacles many. Saram tato grahim apasya phalgu. So take what matters and chuck the rest. Hamsair yathak shiram ibambu madhyat. Like a swan separates milk from the water. 
May your lives be long and obstacles few. Thank you for being here. Anand, thank you. I can imagine no more perfect example of someone who does what he teaches than what you just experienced. Uh, good words performed and believed and lived. Thank you, Anand, for that beginning. Um, and thank you, um, current students. We've said lots of thanks. I'll continue the tradition of thanks in this place. Uh, if we say it enough this day, maybe you'll remember to say it every day, even when it doesn't feel near at hand. Um, thank you to the students, the new students, those of you who have just come to join us in this place. Thank you for trusting us and entrusting us with your spirit, with your passion, with your questions, and most importantly, though you may not feel this always, with your not knowing, with your not knowing. I realize that we're already on the cusp of afternoon, which means that I and these concluding remarks is all that's all that are keeping you from food and conviviality in the common room and the courtyard and then the blessed beauty of an open autumn afternoon. And so though I love a good turn of the phrase and sometimes then allowing that phrase to turn and turn, and turn again. I'm gonna to try to cut to the chase. In just a second, I'm going to invite all of us to sit back, close our eyes, perhaps, if we're people who, for whom silence among others with your eyes wide open is just too much of a good thing. I'm gonna ask you to take a minute, maybe two, all of you newcomers, old timers to remember the time and the place and the persons that you were before you all joined us here in Swift Hall. Whether those times and places and persons were last week or two years ago or five or in my case decades ago. New students remember the anticipation that you felt just before we spent seven days orienting you to the Divinity School. <laughs> Returning students and, and faculty colleagues too, remember that delectable season of discernment that preceded your own arrival here, whenever that was, as you were determining for yourself what questions and disciplines and practices most moved you and casting your lot with what perennially seems an unlikely preoccupation, though never more needful than now. That is the study of the contemplation of the practice of whatever you will come to mean when you say the word religion. Remember what it felt like to set your heart and your mind on this journey, this work, this place, this day, just before we told you what to think about any of it. See if you can recall, perhaps even touch for a moment now, your own deeply human desire for learning. Take a minute. Now, as I invite you back to this moment, scatter a few mental breadcrumbs, a trail that you can use to find your way back to your own sacred source of discernment and direction and delight when you need to. And you will need to in the days and weeks and months ahead. One of the joys of the quarter system, there are some joys of the quarter system, you're gonna find them, 
is that Chicago students and faculty are still in summer mode while watching the rest of the country enter a new school year so that we can sit back and more leisurely contemplate the aims of education from uh, our porch or the beach or our solitary studies. These past several years, I have spent the conventional back to school season mid-August visiting my grandkids on the West Coast. And in the presence of these expert child learners, I am annually reminded of the powerful interplay between knowing, not knowing, and this necessary, essential enactment of human desire that we have come to call learning. Learning. Sitting outside with my just turned six-year-old grandson on a recent Oregon afternoon, having just been the sole audience to a display of skateboarding virtuosity that alternately amazed and terrified me, I told little Reagan that he must have been born knowing how to make that board leap and jump and loop like that. That he made these gravity-defying tricks look easy. And BTW, that was not Grandma Gush. It was God's truth. This little kid rides his board up and down the street, jumps curbs, flies off ramps and railings, like board and child are all of one piece. But to my surprise, my grandson was offended by my compliment. Nuh-uh, he said, indignant to have been so misconstrued. I was not born there. Those tricks are not easy. They are hard. I tried and I tried. And I fell and I fell. I practiced for years. <laughs> the child declared at the age of six years and three days. He profoundly narrated each and every scar and showed them to me. This knee, these elbows, a split chin that he'd accumulated on the way to his ownership of these stunts. And he recounted with joy and laughter and maybe a little bit of embellishment some of his most spectacular crashes, even reenacted a few of them. And then he schooled me with this observation. Grandma, he says, boarders know. <laughs> boarders know that it's the learning that's the funnest part, not the knowing. It's the learning that's the funnest part, not the knowing. What a six-year-old's body knows is that we are built for curiosity, daring, trial, and error, and that moving through the world in accordance with that fundamental desire to learn and grow is both life-giving for oneself and contagious in communities like this one. Our instinctive love of learning can stir up the same in those around us. Six-year-old Reagan got me up out of my porch chair, got me to ride the board which was entirely exhilarating once I stopped screaming. <laughs> and though I probably don't have enough years left of life to master that ramp, I may yet try. Later that night, when we were cuddled on the couch reading books, Reagan whispered to me that first grade scared him because, he said, first graders are supposed to read by themselves. He was shocked and delighted to hear that even something as mysterious as reading wasn't simply, simply given knowledge, something known, but it was there for the learning just like riding the board. What a travesty that education has become the possession of knowledge by and for the few, rather than the evocation, the instigation, the enactment of that desire for more. That is the birthright of all of us. And so now, too many turns of phrase later, 
My charge for all of us in this place this year is that we not let our insecurities about the possession of knowledge get in the way of living our questions. Letting that curiosity power us, trying and failing and maybe trying and failing and maybe trying and failing again to keep our balance as we navigate some of humanity's most complicated intersections of text and thought and tradition and experience and practice and action. There will be crashes, I promise you, maybe even scars. So one of my sainted mentors instructed me during my first pastorate, anything worth doing is worth doing badly at first. But may there also be laughter and joy as together we exercise our human capacity not only to know but to stretch and to grow and to try and to fail and to love and to risk. Remember the desire that brought you here. Bring that desire with you to lunch to the quad, to class, to internships, to conversations over tea and coffee with friends, to all the spaces in Chicago where you walk. Be illuminated by that desire as our autumn days grow shorter and let it warm you when Chicago's winter winds take your breath away. Remember that it's the learning that's the funnest part and the bravest and the truest, and the most needful for your own work, for that of your colleagues here, for our hungry and hurting world. It's the learning that's the funnest part. Let's begin. Go in peace.